So um, the, next, the next chapter is about variability and how we behave. It's, it's entitled Physician Variability, but there we have a lot of non-physicians here, so I'm going to uh, extend it to Provider Variability. And um, this is written by Rick Bucata. Many of you know Rick. Uh, and he um, has been talking about this for a long time. It's, uh, it's a, there's actually um, this group in Dartmouth which publishes this thing called the Dartmouth Atlas. Any of you know about this? No? Nobody knows it? So they, what they've basically done is gone and looked at practice across the United States. And they find variability in just about everything you can measure in ways that are unexplainable. So in one town, if you have a certain type of chest pain and a certain score on your stress test, 90% of the time you get a stent. And in the next town over, 2% of the time you get a stent. And there's no difference in outcome. And that's been studied. The Dartmouth has studied this for many, many, many different things. And they find that there are these unexplained cultural variations that go from city to city, that go from hospital to hospital, and that there's also variation within hospitals. And that it's inexplicable. So this chapter, I could, I could stop right there. The amount of variability is extraordinary. You can read these articles, and you'll see that it makes no sense. Some of us see a patient with minor head trauma and scan them all. Some see a patient with minor head trauma and scan almost none of them. So the big question, I'm going to give you some examples, give you some numbers, just to show you how bizarre this is. But that's the content. The numbers don't really matter. The details don't matter. What we have to talk about is why is this, and what's good and what's bad about it, and what should we do about it. So here's some numbers. Here's kids who came in less than um, little kids, 42,000 with blunt minor head trauma with a normal GCS. The CT rate from individual doctors, from individual hospitals, excuse me, ran between the lowest CT rate was 19% and the highest was 70% for the same patients. Absolutely no difference in outcome. For individuals, one person to find an injury. This is not an important injury. It's an injury, period. Not something they did something about. One doctor got it for every 14 CTs and one for every 112 CTs to find one injury. That was the average. It's pretty bizarre. Here's kids with community-acquired pneumonia. Blood cultures in one hospital, the rate of blood cultures with community-acquired pneumonia was 80%. And in another hospital, 0%. How about electrolytes? The range was between 0 and 68% in kids admitted with community acquired pneumonia. How about admission rates? Kids with fever. Kids um, less than 28 days, you better be really careful about sending a kid home who has a fever less than 28 days. The admission rate ranged between, in different hospitals, and these are huge databases, 50% to 100%. But what about if they're a little older? There it's a little trickier. So little kids, you should worry. But how about um, 29, one month to two months? The rate of admission ranged from 3% to 65%. And over two months? It ranged, oh, excuse me, the, the other one was 17 to 80%. And over two months, kids with a fever from 3% to 65%. No difference in any outcomes. So I could give you more numbers. Um, admission rates for, for uh, children with, two, 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 for all children, admission rates at pediatric hospitals ranged from 12% to 95% in children's hospitals. I mean, it makes no sense. Variability of head CT use in atraumatic headache. Some hospitals 15%, some hospitals 60% who had an atraumatic headache got a CT. Can you imagine that? Somebody comes in with a headache, more than half of them get a CT? It's pretty amazing. Um, Same with trauma. If they had trauma anywhere on their chart, 
<laughs> one doctor ordered a CT in 42% of people who had any sign of trauma, including a laceration. It's pretty amazing. Um, so there's also variability in how much we use different treatments. Admission rates for community-acquired pneumonia, 38% to 79%. Not explained by any patient characteristics. So this is crazy, right? I mean, it makes no sense. So which is right? Should you do it in 3% or 38% or 92%? Well, for many of the things, we don't know the answer, right? There is no right answer. And obviously, there are some people who do need a test and some people who don't need a test. But if we're all seeing basically the same population of people, um, you know, on any individual day, you might see more sick people than the next day, and you might order more CTs one day than the next day. But if you're consistently ordering 80% and somebody else is ordering 2% and there's no difference, something's wrong, right? So um, why is that happening? And when is it OK to have variability? And when is it not OK? And what should we do about it? So in your group, do you, have, do you know people who order a lot of tests? And others who don't? Go ahead. So he's suggesting it's so he's suggesting two things: risk aversion, and the second is training. How many of you trained in a place where you got punished if you didn't know the answer to the question, "What was the potassium?" or "What was the thyroid?" Did he have thyroid functions last year? I mean, so part of this we 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 learn what we're we're told to do. And obviously, there are a difference in different training programs. And part of it is the sense, if you ask people how afraid they are. But when it's been studied, when you ask doctors, are you risk averse or not, it doesn't really correlate very well with what they order. And that could mean one of two things, that there's no correlation or that we're very, uh, we, we have very bad self-judgment. You know, we are risk averse, and we say we're not, or the, or the opposite. So I don't know exactly what that means. OK, so there probably are different characteristics amongst us, and we've been trained in different ways. When is it OK for there to be variability? When would it be OK to say, you do a little more, I do a little less, there's no, no big deal? I mean, just theoretically. As long as the outcomes are the same. What? As long as the outcomes are the same. So if we don't know what the answer is, and there's no, it's not obvious that one is better. So there are different ways in which something could be better or worse. One is that patients suffer. You miss things. We don't want that. But another way in which there's better or worse is we're spending a lot of money, we're spending a lot of time, we're doing unnecessary things, et cetera. If what the intervention is no big deal and one does a little more, puts in four stitches and one puts in three stitches, it doesn't really matter that much. You're not spending money. There's no harm. It's not been shown that four stitches is better or worse than three stitches. There's room for variability. There's so much in medicine we don't know the answer that we shouldn't insist you should only do 12%. Don't do 15% CTs. We don't know what the right answer is. There's room for some degree of variability. What seems to be bad is when doing more costs more, takes up more time, leads to incidental omas and all that other stuff, if there's no advantage to it, it's hard to imagine why you would do it. And that seems to be that the motivation for that should be is either fear or sense of shame or blame or whatever it is, but it's not helping patients. It's not helping our society. So we shouldn't be doing more unless there's a reason to do more, or we don't know the answer. We haven't yet figured out what the right thing is. When I tell you that if somebody comes in with a little bump in the head and it's a kid and they're normal and somebody's doing CTs and 90% of them, this is craziness, right? So. Where does that come from? Somebody said, mentioned malpractice before. I, I personally don't think that's the real issue, because I think you know, we know that even if malpractice isn't there, those types of behaviors occur. It has something to do with a fear of missing things. It's certainly true that all the incentives are for us to do more. If you have somebody who comes in, I told this story on, on NPR once, and it's sort of a little bit of a famous story. I had a patient come in a young woman, 17 years of age, in a minor fender bender. And she was coming, came in a backboard and a neck collar. And, um, and we had a, a, a policy at UCLA that as soon as somebody came in a backboard, you saw them immediately to get them off the board, because you knew that they were going to be 
having symptoms if you let them lay on the board for very long. So we would go and clinically clear them. And this was at a time that after we had done Nexus and shown that you could clinically clear people. So I went to this young woman, clinically cleared her. She was fine. Everything was good. Took the collar off, had her sit up. She was fine. Her mother comes in, and her mother says, <clears throat> her mother's a nurse, and her mother says, doesn't she need an x-ray? And I say, no, you know, here's why. She's fine. I did this test, and everything's fine. She's fine. And the mother's OK. And then the father comes in, and the father is this big. I mean, he's a big, big guy, big guy. And he's very loud. And he says, the first thing he says is, you will get a CT on her. And the second thing he says is, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> and both of these he says in a very loud voice. And it's in a hallway in a busy ED. And everybody can hear. I mean, he's made a big stand. You will get a CT. And um, so I had, you know, I tried to do my usual stuff. I told him, I don't know, she doesn't really need it. It's not good for her, blah, blah, blah. blah. You know, here's why. I'm not worried, blah, blah, blah. He's having none of it. He's really getting angry, and he's yelling, and he's screaming. And, and I'm thinking to myself, why am I refusing to do this? Am I just going to show I have more power than he does? Am I just being silly? You know, I could just easily get the CT. But I'm thinking to myself, it, she doesn't need a CT. This is crazy. It's a young woman. Why would I do that? This is crazy. Could I be wrong? Yes, I could be wrong. Anything's possible. But I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure I'm not wrong. I'm sure it's the wrong thing to get a CT. So I do my best to talk to him, and he's having none of it. And it's a really unpleasant thing. And people are looking. And at some point, I said to him, uh, I said to him, you know, I'm really sorry, but I, I really have to see other patients. And he said, my time is as important as yours. And I said, no, no it isn't, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say that. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> But what I said was, you know, uh, I got to see other pay. I have to see other pay. You know, I'm, sitting, I'm standing there, and I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do here? Am I going to do this unnecessary CT for no reason for this young woman, and, which I think is harmful? Or am I just going to show him that I'm, you know, what am I going to do? And I, I did, really didn't, you know, I was sort of didn't know what to do. Because my experience usually has been that when people want things, if you're nice and you talk to them, they get it, and they're, they're usually very reasonable. And this guy was obviously very, very unreasonable. And it was compounded by the fact that everybody's looking at us, and I, you know, I'm, I, I know the residents are looking, and other patients are looking, and the staff is looking, and I have to make a decision. And I said something that had never occurred to me before, but which I had known for a long, long time. It just sort of came out of me, and it turned out to be the, the right thing to say. Um, we're supposed to be a profession, right? When we, what we do, we're supposed to be professionals. Have you ever thought of what that means to be a professional? Yes. Yeah. So what is it we profess? And what we actually profess, there's a whole sociology literature about this, which says what we profess is that we have skills and knowledge that the general public needs, but they can't get for themselves. It's too complicated. You can't go to the internet and become a doctor in three minutes. You can't do it. They need us. And what they do is they make a deal with us. Society makes a deal with us that they give us all sorts of rights and privileges. And if you think about it, doctors get lots of rights and privileges in response for a promise. And the promise is we put them first. We're what's called a fiduciary. If their interests and our interests conflict, we have to do what's in their interest. We're allowed to follow our own interests, but not when it's to the harm of the patient. That's what we, what we basically promise. That's what the, the notion of the sociologic notion of a profession is. So I, thought, so I said to this guy, you know, I looked at him and I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. I really, it's stupid for me not to do the CT. I should do the CT. You know, if I do the CT, you will be happy with me. Whereas if I don't, you're going to write a complaint about me. So it's obviously better for me to do the CT. And you know what's more? If I'm wrong, I, it's no chance I'm wrong, but if I'm wrong, It'll save my butt. I won't go to court, and I won't, have, I won't have this terrible thing where I miss the terrible injury. It's way better for me to know that CT is, is, is right. And you know what? It, it would save me a lot of time. I'm spending all this time talking to you, and I wouldn't have to. I could just write the thing for the CT. It would be really easier. And you know what else? I get paid more if I do the CT. So it is absolutely crazy for me not to do the CT. And I said, but there's only one problem. 
I made this promise when I became a doctor that I would put my patient's interest in front of my own. So although it's in my interest to do the CT, I have made this decision that it's against her interest, it's bad for her. So I'm sorry, I can't do it. I said some version of that. And this guy, who had been yelling and loud, and he said and his, law, his jaw literally dropped open, and he, he was silent. And I walked away. And then I got the lawsuit uh, next week. No, I didn't. There was no. <laughs> it, really, it really did happen. He had nothing to say. There was not, what was he going to say? I said, you know, I can't do it. It's not in your daughter's interest. I wish I could. It would be good for me, but I can't. And that was the end of it. And of course, she didn't have any friends. I, I don't think she had anything. She never came back. Um, <laughs> um, why am I saying all this? Because I think one of the things is that to, to acknowledge that what we do is very complicated. And there are lots and lots of pressures on us. And there are lots of reasons why we do things even when we know that they're not really what we should be doing. We did this study a couple of years ago which involved people coming to this course, where we did a survey of practicing emergency providers, including at this course, where we asked them, have you ever done something where you said, where, where, which we would define as unnecessary, which means if you didn't have any outside pressure and you were doing it just for medical care, you wouldn't do it. You knew it was unnecessary, but did it anyway. And 97% of respondents said, yes, I've done that. And I was very proud of them because I thought that meant, you know, usually there's this thing called social desirability bias where you don't, we, you don't say something that sounds bad. But everybody said, yes, I've done that. I know I have personally done it. In most studies, people say, I don't do that. My neighbor does it, but I don't ever do that. But here, everybody acknowledged doing it. And that's to make the point that we're all under a lot, a lot of pressure. So if we want to change that, we have to go upstream and look at what those pressures are and why we're doing these things. But it's clear that if we want to be professionals, and what we really care about is putting the outcomes of our patients first, we know that we're, we admit no risk chest pain, that's harmful. Every one of us knows that. I always make the joke that I have the Hoffman rule for chest pain is way better than all of these other rules that have been published, that all of which have been proven to fail. You know, the Goldman rule, and the Timmy rule, and the Timmy 3, and the Timmy 7A, and the heart score, and all that, they all fail. And my rule is really simple, which is it's safe to discharge them if your plan is to admit them to OBS. The moment you decide to admit somebody to OBS, you should send them home. And I know that that's right. Why do I know it's right? Because every study that looks at patients who are admitted to OBS shows that, that one in a thousand has a bad outcome. You cannot do better than that. Which means when we admit patients to OBS, we know that they are fine. Not 100%, but just as close as you can humanly possibly get. What's more, think about it. Would you ever admit a patient you were worried about to OBS? Of course not. Are we doing neutral by admitting them to OBS? No, we're doing harm. We're doing lots and lots of harm to the healthcare system, to patients individ as individuals, making them cripples, making them cardiac patients. It's cr and then they get all this downstream stuff that has been proven to be harmful. We do it because we're under all this pressure. So none of us likes doing that. None of you want to admit patients do things you don't, you don't really believe in. So the question now is, how are we going to fix it? Because it's easy for me to get up here and pontificate. And I know that's what I'm doing. But, it, but it's also possible to, to behave differently. Those of you who are older used to practice in a slightly different way. So how are we going to do better? That's the question. How are we going to, what are we going to do about variability? Get rid of patient satisfaction scores. So one thing is get rid of patient satisfaction scores. You know, and that's, that's a, a little bit ironic, because of course we should care about patient satisfaction. That should be very important to us. It's just we measure it in a very stupid way, right? And what we really should care about is doing the right thing for patients. And when you do the right things for patients, which has to do with spending time with them, that's what really determines patient satisfaction. And, and that's really important. But what else should we do? What? OK, but let's go, uh, that's not going to change CT ordering. Education. Of whom? Doctors. Education of the doctors. So that's what we're doing here. Who else do we have to educate? 
patients. We sure have to educate patients. We blame them for wanting things, but we've taught them to want those things. They think medicine is a miracle, that every symptom is a disease. If you're sad, that's a disease, and that we have a treatment for everything. And that's crazy. We've taught them that. And then we get mad at them for, for buying it. You expected me to do everything. People die. Don't you know that? But we've taught them. You know, we do, we do miracles. So, right, so uh, the, the wonder of the internet is that you can learn lots and lots of things. The bad part of the internet is that much of what you learn is wrong, right? So the internet, you can find wonderful things on it, and you can find things that are completely wrong, and patients read both of them. And that's a problem. So uh, when I ask you what are we going to do about it, I'm not proposing to give you an answer, because I don't have an answer. And there's certainly no simple answer. But I do think if we don't start asking ourselves what we're going to do about it, we are hopeless, because this is terrible what we're doing. We are doing lots of harm by modern medicine. We overdo in ways that are not only bankrupting us, but are harming individual patients in many, 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 many ways. And, none of, and it harms us. None of us like to practice like that. We would all like rather practice the way we think we should. So, I'll, I'm going to read you, before I finish, some of the things that Rick has suggested we should do about variability. I don't think they're, th there's nothing proven about this, as he made this up, but they're, they're, they're thoughtful. So, but the most important thing I want you to think about is, how are you going to change where you work? How are you going to start educating yourself and your colleagues and your patients? How are we going to tackle this craziness that we do all these things that make no sense? and where, in fact, we know we're overdoing in many circumstances to the harm of our patients. Here's what Rick says. You have to have senior level administrators involved who are committed to this. I'm not sure what that means, but that's what he says. He says there must be carrots and sticks. So rewards for doing better and, and punishments for doing worse. And the devil's in the details there. Um, the program, whatever you do, shouldn't be about finding bad apples, but to move the entire group to do better. Okay, that's a nice theoretical notion. Individual performance must be measured. And you have to have adequate sample size, so it doesn't matter on one day you order a lot of CTs, doesn't mean you always order a lot of CTs. You have to have an adequate sample. But that you have to measure what you're doing and what everybody else is doing. And he suggests that you should do that. It should all be private. That is to say, you see your own scores and you see the group scores, but nobody else sees your scores. Go ahead, you can. Right. So what you're suggesting that Rick is saying is that the administrator has to understand that it's not the way you handle this is not with the traditional stupid scoring. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing that I would say, uh, as one of those commercials, you know. Right. So, so there, are, there are huge, huge pressures on us. And certainly a for-profit health system, I shouldn't say for-profit because that makes it sound like not-for-profit is different. And in our system, not-for-profit is for-profit. So what I really mean is a profit-driven health system, like in the United States, puts lots of pressure on us to do lots of bad things, including the pharmaceutical industry, including the device industry, including the guy who's ordering the MRI gets paid for, for ordering the MRI and for reading it, et cetera. We have a real, yes, absolutely. I think what, what, just to summarize those seven points, and you can read them yourself, is that you should have, in your department, you should try to figure out what's going on. Are we doing things dramatically different that make no sense? And if so, can we help people who are, for whatever their reason, overdoing, move in the right direction? And that, that should be not punitive, but it should have consequences. So you're not doing it because they're bad, but they have to, you know, if you're ordering 90 CTs and everybody else is ordering three, you have to figure out a way to do better. Now, I, I'm not sure that's really the right answer because, you know, people, if you force somebody to do something they're not comfortable with, I'm not sure how much good you do. But I do think this is a huge issue for us, and I don't, I don't think we can keep ignoring it. And in particular, we live in a world now where all the, all the impetus, all the incentives are for us to do more. And we've bought into a mythology that more is better, that 
technology solves problems, that earlier is better, screening before you're sick, most of these turn out to be not true. Doing more testing, information is power. Not if you don't know what to do with the information. Not if it's bad information. We have to address this. I don't have answers for you. I've been spending a lot of my career railing about this. I think we all need to talk about it. Go ahead, Mary Margaret. One of the things we have done, and they So you have peer review, but. So you can do that. There, there, obviously, there's risks in that. There are ways in which, you know, the person may feel attacked and feel like, you know, you're doing this it's self-serving. I mean, sure, I, I, I'm not going to argue. Go ahead. Right, and, and so you're making the point that that the evidence here is not that I looked at this case and it was stupid, but the evidence is this person's ordering it in 10 percent. You're ordering it 90 percent. Something's wrong. I can't tell which of the cases is wrong or right, but I can tell that overall something's going on. So the, the, the of course, right, so, right, right. So, so there may be some there may be some rule for individual guidance with somebody who everybody trusts. On the other hand, there's also flaws in that. I guess the the point I keep trying to make is that if in fact in your group. When a little kid comes and bumps their head, three of your partners are ordering a CT scan one out of every 10, and nobody's getting missed. And you're ordering nine out of 10, and nobody's getting missed. You're doing something wrong. We can, I don't know which one you did it wrong. Maybe on an individual case, I would say, I don't know the details. Yeah, it was OK. But something's wrong if you're always ordering 10 times as much as your peers. How we deal with that is complex. And it's going to have to go way beyond just telling somebody don't do it. It's going to have to go back to why are we so scared of our shadow? Why have we made medicine into we are not allowed to miss anything? This is, that's really the problem. In our society, no one's allowed to have a bad outcome. You get blamed if there's any bad outcome. This is craziness. But if we don't, well, we can't just throw our hands up and say there's nothing to do. We're hurting people. We have to do something about this. 